Today we shall continue speaking about the history of the United Kingdom. The history of the United Kingdom has always fascinated people all over the world, as it is full of incredible stories and legends about the rise of Britain as a nation. So, lecture number five is devoted to Britain, the making of the nation. Lecture plan covers the history of Wales, Ireland, Scotland, and some facts about feudalism. From the previous lecture, we know that in 1066, William became the king of England. William's followers in his conquest had to be rewarded. The Norman knights and barons, like the Saxon nobility they replaced, were given the land not only because they had helped to win it, but because they could help to hold it. The peasants on the land were bound to them to provide a labor force in time of peace and foot soldiers in war. The Normans introduced the name feudalism for this system, but the structure itself was several centuries old. The word feudalism comes from the French word feu, which uh, the Normans used to refer to land held in return for duty or service to a lord. The basis of feudal society was holding of land, and its main purpose was economic. The central idea was that all land was owned by the king, but it was held by others, called vassals, in return for services and goods. The king gave large estates to his main nobles in return for a promise to serve him in war. The nobles also had to give part of the produce of the land. The greater nobles gave part of their lands to lesser nobles, knights and other free men. Some freemen paid for the land by doing military service, while others paid rent. The nobles kept serf to work on his own land. These were not free to leave the estate and were often little better than slaves. By 1086, William wanted to know exactly who owned which piece of land and how much it was worth. He needed this information so that he could plan his economy find out how much was produced and how much he could ask in tax. He sent a team of people all through England to make a complete econo economic survey. His men asked all kinds of questions at each state, uh, settlement. How much land was there? Who owned it? How much was it worth? How many families, plows and sheep were there? And so on. This survey was the only one of its kind in Europe. Not surprisingly, it was most unpopular with the people because they felt they couldn't escape from its findings. This reminded them of the paintings of the Day of Judgment or Doom on the walls of their churches, but they called it the Doomsday Book. And the Doomsday Book still exists and gives us an extraordinary amount of information about England at this time. There were two basic principles of feudalism. Every man had a lord, and every lord had land. The king was connected through his chain of people to the lowest man in the country. At each level a man had to promise service to his lord. This promise was usually made with the lord sitting on his chair in his vassal kneeling before him, his hands placed between those of his lord. This was called homage and has remained part of the coronation ceremony of British kings and queens until now. On the other hand, each lord had responsibilities to his vassals. He had to give them land and protection. When a noble died, his son usually took over his estate. But first he had to receive permission from the king and make a special payment. If he was still a child, the king would often take the produce of the state until the boy was old enough to look after the estate himself. In this way, the king could benefit from the death of a noble. If all the noble's family died, the land went back to the king, who would be expected to give it to another deserving noble. But the king often kept the land for some years, using its wealth before giving it to another noble. If the king didn't give the noble's land, they would not fight for him. Between 1066 and the mid-14th century, there were only 30 years of complete peace. 
So feudal duties were extremely important. The king had to make sure he had enough satisfied nobles who would be willing to fight for him. England always played the most powerful part in the history of the British Isles. However, the other three countries, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, have a different history. Until recently, few historians looked at British history except from an English point of view. But the stories of Wales, Ireland and Scotland are also important because their people still feel different from the Anglo-Saxon English. The experience of the Welsh, Irish and Scots helps to explain the feeling we have today. By the 8th century, most of the Celts had been driven into the Welsh peninsula. They were kept out of England by Offa's Dyke, the huge earth wall built in AD 779. These Celts, called Welsh by the Anglo-Saxons, called themselves Cymru, fellow countrymen. Because Wales is a mountainous country, the Cymru could only live in the crowded valleys. The rest of the land was rocky and too poor for anything except keeping animals. For this reason, the population remained small. It only grew to over half a million in the 18th century. Life was hard and so was the behavior of the people. Slavery was common as it had been all through Celtic Britain. Society was based on family groupings, each of which owned one or more village or farm settlement. One by one in each group, a strong leader made himself king. These men must have been tribal chiefs to begin with, who later managed to become overlords over neighboring family groups. Each of these kings tried to conquer the others, and the idea of a high or senior king developed. The early kings traveled around their kingdoms to remind the people of their control. They traveled with their hungry followers and soldiers. The ordinary people ran away into the hills and woods when the king's men approached their village. Life was dangerous. In 1043, the king of Glamorgan died of old age. It was an unusual event because between 949 and 1066, no less than 35 Welsh rulers died violently, usually killed by a Cymru, a fellow countryman. In 1039, Rufid was the first Welsh king strong enough to rule over all Wales. He was also the last. And in order to remain in control, he spent almost the whole of his reign fighting his enemies. Like many other world rulers, he was killed by a Cymru while defending Wales against the Saxons. Welsh kings after him were able to rule only after they had promised loyalty to Edward the Confessor, King of England. The story of independent and united Wales was over almost as soon as it had begun. The evidence suggests that by the first century AD, the language spoken in Wales and throughout southern Britain was a Celtic language. As aspects of Britain society, its class structure, for example, and the beliefs and practices of its priesthood are also considered to have had links with Gael. These considerations, together with the artistic style of metal objects made in Iron Age in Wales, gave rise to the notion that the inhabitants of Wales in the last centuries of prehistory were members of a Celtic nation. While there is no certainty about the way in which much of Britain became Celtic-speaking, the fact that it did is of central importance in the history of Wales. Roman forces reached the borders of Wales in AD 48, five years later after they had begun their conquest of Britain. At the time, of course, Wales didn't exist in any meaningful sense. It had at least five tribal groupings. Among the earliest attacks by the Romans upon what would become Wales took place across the River Dee and was uh, aimed at dividing the people of the highland of Wales from the highlands of the north of what would rather be England. Wales was part of the Roman Empire for about 300 years. During that era, Roman habits and culture won widespread acceptance in much of the country. Unlike in most of Western Europe, 
the Latin of the Romans didn't replace the native language of the people in Wales. It did, however, have an impact upon it. For example, it absorbed Latin words for things like forts, rooms, and books, words which were passed on to the Welsh language. Ireland was never invaded by either the Romans or the Anglo-Saxons. It was a land of monasteries and had a flourishing Celtic culture. As in Wales, people were known by the family grouping they belonged to. Outside their tribe, they had no protection and no name of their own. They had only the name of their tribe. The kings in this tribal society were chosen by election. The idea was that the strongest man should lead. In fact, the system led to continuous challenges. Five kingdoms grew up in Ireland. Ulster in the north, Munster in the southwest, Leinster in the southeast, Connacht in the west, with Tara as the seat of the High Kings of Ireland. Christianity came to Ireland at about AD 430. The beginning of the Ireland history dates from that time because for the first time there were people who could write down events. The message of the Christianity was spread in Ireland by the British slave Patrick, who became the patron saint of Ireland. Christianity brought writing, which weakened the position of the Druids, who depended on memory and the spoken word. Christian monasteries grew up frequently along the coast. This period is often called Ireland's Golden Age. Invaders were unknown and culture flowered. But it is also true that the five kingdoms were often at war, each trying to gain advantage over the other, often with great cruelty. This Golden Age suddenly ended with the arrival of Viking raiders who stole all that the monasteries had. Very little was left except the stone memorials that the Vikings couldn't carry away. The Vikings who traded with different countries like Italy, Russia and Istanbul brought fresh economic and political action into Irish life. Viking raids forced the Irish to unite. And 859, Ireland chose its first high king but it was not an effective solution because of the quarrels that took place each time a new high king was chosen. Viking trade led to the first towns and ports. For the Celts, who had always lived in small settlements, these were revolutionary. Dublin, Ireland's future capital, was founded by the Vikings. As an effective method of rule, the high kingship of Ireland lasted only 12 years, from 1002 to 1014, while Ireland was ruled by Brian Borrow. He still looked back on as the Ireland's greatest ruler. He tried to create one single Ireland and encouraged the growth of organizations in the church, in administration, and in learning. Brian Borrow died in battle against the Vikings. One of the five Irish kings, the King of Leinster, fought on the Viking side. Just over a century later, another King of Leinster invited the Normans of England to help him against the High King. This gave the Normans the excuse they wanted to enlarge their kingdom. The history of Scotland is fascinating and complex. There were Roman soldiers, Vikings, noble clansmen, powerful ruling monarchs, and even enlightened philosophers. Scotland has experienced extraordinary growth and change during the course of its lifetime. It's a place that has been invaded and settled many times and has made mighty contributions to culture and society. Scotland was populated by four separate groups of people. The main group, the Picts, lived mostly in the north and northeast. They spoke Celtic as well as another, probably older language, completely unconnected with any known language today. They seem to have been the earliest inhabitants of the land. The Picts were different from the Celts because they inherited their rights, their names and property from their mothers, not from their fathers. The non-Pictish inhabitants were mainly Scots, 
The Scots were Celtic settlers who had started to move into the Western Highlands from Ireland in the 4th century. In 843, the Pictish and Scottish kingdoms were united as Scottish king, who could also probably claim the Pictish throne through his mother, in this way obeying both Scottish and Pictish rules of kingship. The third group were the Britons, who inhabited the lowlands and had been part of the Romano-British world. They had probably given up their old tribal way of life by the 6th century. Finally, there were Angles from Northumbria who had pushed northwards into the Scottish lowlands. Unity between the Pict Scots and Britons was achieved for several reasons. They all shared a common Celtic culture, language and background. Their economy mainly depended on keeping animals. These animals were owned by the tribe as a whole, and for this reason land was also held by tribes, not by individual people. The common economic system increased their feeling of belonging to the same king of society, and the feeling of difference from the agricultural lowlands. The sense of common culture may have been increased by marriages between tribes, this idea of common land holding remained strong until the tribes of Scotland, called clans, collapsed in the 18th century. The spread of Celtic Christianity also helped to unite the people. The first Christian mission to Scotland in about AD 400, later in 563, known as the Dove of the Church, came from England, Ireland. Through this work, both Highland Scots and Picts were brought to Christianity. He even defeated a monster in Loch Ness, the first mention of this famous creature. By 663, the Pict Scots and Britons had all been brought closer together by Christianity. Vikings attacked the coastal areas of Scotland, and they settled on many of the islands, Shetland, the Orkneys, the Hebrides, and the Isle of Man, southwest of Scotland. In order to resist them, Picts and Scots thought, fought together against the enemy raiders. When they couldn't push them out of the islands and coastal areas, they had to deal with them politically. The Scots decided to seek the friendship of the English because of the likely losses from war. England was obviously stronger than Scotland, but luckily for the Scots, both the north of England and Scotland were difficult to control from London. The Scots hoped that, if they were reasonably peaceful, the Saxons would leave them alone. Scotland remained a difficult country to rule, even from its capital Edinburgh. Anyone looking at a map of Scotland can immediately see that control of the highlands and islands was a great problem. Travel was often impossible in winter and slow and difficult in summer. A brief review of Scotland's history. In 12,000 BC, people started to occupy Scotland. They were just small groups of people who were hunters, who hunted wild animals in forests. In 4000 BC, people first started cultivating and claiming ownership of the land in Scotland. In 2500 BC, the arrival of metalworking shows the start of the Bronze Age. 700 BC, the Iron Age saw people making better tools and weapons. AD 79, Scotland's recorded history began with the arrival of the Romans. AD 300, the early historic period referred to the area when Scotland history first started to be recorded in writing. There are records written mostly by monks that tell us that the Christianity reached the west of Scotland in AD 563. AD 800, around this time the Vikings arrived to trade and settle around Scotland. In 1040, the medieval period saw the gradual expansion of the Scottish Kingdom as kings and queens came and went at a steady pace. The best known early Scottish king, Macbeth, was killed in battle in 1057.
1306, Robert the Bruce was crowned the King of Scotland. War between the English and Scots raged until 1314, when Robert the Bruce army defeated Edward II. 1542, Mary Stuart, you might know her as Mary Queen of Scots, became queen when she was just six years old, following the death of her father James V. She was sent to France aged five and returned to rule Scotland in 1561. But she was executed by her cousin Queen Elizabeth I in 1587. 1603, after Elizabeth I died without an heir, James VI of Scotland, Mary Queen's, Queen of Scots' son, succeeded to the English throne and became James VI. 1689-1746 James uh, VII's grandson, Prince Charles Edward Stuart, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, arrived in Scotland to try to rally the troops. The history of the United Kingdom as a single political unit occupies little more than one and three quarter centuries. England and Wales, united in 1536, were not formally joined with Scotland into one kingdom until 1707, and it was only in 1800 that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland was formed. Britain's unity has not always been maintained easily. After the First World War, force was used to keep control of Ireland, but the attempt failed and Southern Ireland became independent in 1922. In 1927, the United Kingdom changed its formal title to the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Here are some comprehension questions for you to consider and answer in written form. Thank you for your interest in the history of the United Kingdom. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel.